Hey there, my name is Lilith and I'm the creator behind fashion art label Zigenthaler, based in Melbourne, Australia. Melbourne, the place that has just opened up after the world's longest lockdown, and I can somehow come across as being somewhat sane, still. Today I'm bringing you a very special and exciting two-part series called Fabric Paint Troubleshooting. And I've decided to make these videos because I get a lot of questions about different problems or uh, issues people that are having with different fabric paints. It might be the fabric paints I'm using or what they've bought or like mediums they've used and stuff like that. And I wanted to create a two-part series where I actually talk about the mechanics of fabric paint and actually take you through a conversation I've had with a fellow artist about uh, problems he was having with his fabric paint and basically how to diagnose what you're doing wrong, if there's anything in your control or what the formula or with the color and stuff like that. So this first video is going to be me going into basically the science of paint and then the second video is going to be I will take you through the conversation that I had with this artist. We're basically going to run through it and I'm just going to show you like different solutions and uh, things that I recommend in regards to the knowledge that you're going to learn in this video today. Uh, just a heads up if you do want to see more content about painting on denim, fabric painting, thrift flipping, sustainable fashion, everything like that, please make sure to subscribe to my channel channel and please give me a like and you will see all the uh, different types of content on that long introduction so the science of paint I've been doing a little bit of research and even though I have been using paint for a very long time it was actually quite interesting to know the fundamental sort of components of paint and how that can actually help you to uh, figure out the problems that you're having and today I'm also going to be doing a little experiment with three different types of paint and it's just going to show you why I'm such a big advocate for using fabric paint when you're painting on clothes and not acrylic paint. We've got a normal sort of canvas acrylic paint or a craft paint, my preferred fabric paint that I use which is set a color opaque and then we're also going to use a Posca paint pen just because I got a comment on one of my videos about these and I just figured because they are a very popular product we will be going into sort of how these all compare to each other in regards to the components of how paint is made. So the science of paint. Paint is made up of three elements. Sometimes you might come across that paint is made up of four, but the fourth element is usually just additives, which I don't really want to go into in great detail today. But any paint that you use, acrylic paint, water paint, fabric paint, wall paint, spray paint, has three components to it. You've got the pigment, the binder and the solvent. And I'm going to go into a little detail of the roles that these play and how you can sort of, and use the knowledge to your advantage. So the first component of paint is the pigment. Pretty sure that is very self-explanatory. The pigment is the color of the paint and it can usually come in the form of maybe a powder or a dye. It's the aesthetic part of the paint. It's the main visual aspect of a paint. An example of a pigment is titanium dioxide. A very common paint color is titanium white. So that is the pigment for that. You've got obviously lots of different pigments for lots of different paints depending on what paint that you're buying. But yes, pigment. There's not, nothing really much I need to explain there, I don't think. The second part of a paint is a binder. Arguably the most important part of a paint for me when it comes to fabric paint. I understand the binder as it sort of gives body to the paint. So when you actually have a pigment and it's like a dye or a powder, you can't really paint with just a pigment. You need sort of a body that the pigment can absorb into to create something that's a little bit more substantial that you can paint with. When you think about icing a cake, if you want to ice a cake with really nice pink frosting, the pigment is essentially the food coloring that you have. Like it's the very intense color, but you can't ice a cake just with that intense color. You need a body for that color to absorb into and to become the icing. So you add sugar and eggs, depending on your icing recipes. I understand as the binder is probably the main function of the paint, especially when it comes to things like fabric paint, where you want something that's going to be a little bit more flexible than canvas paint and a little bit more durable. The pigment can't really do much if it's by itself. You need the two together to create something that's on its way to becoming paint. I'm going to come back to 
the significance of binder because we need to know the third part of paint to explain this. So the third part of paint is a solvent. Basically, what the solvent does is it takes the pigment and the binder, which is this gloppy stuff, and it waters it down and makes it to a consistency that you can actually paint with it. Because binder and pigment usually together are not something that you can paint with. It could be very rigid, it can be very thick. The solvent is added so that we can actually put that stuff on our paintbrush and paint it over surfaces. A very popular solvent is water, and I think that would probably be why like, you've got water-based acrylic paints, and they're obviously paints that dry really fast, because the whole function of the solvent is that the solvent is there when the paint is wet, but it's not there when the paint is dry. When the solvent evaporates, you have dry paint, which is essentially just the pigment and the binder. Boom! So I think that solvents also can be called thinners and it depends on whatever way that you're applying the paint. So for instance, if you use craft and acrylic paint, it's obviously a lot more thicker than if you're using a spray paint, which is obviously something, you know, something that's sort of being dispersed over a large space, which means things like spray paints need to be a lot more thinner, so they would have a lot more of a solvent in it over something that's a little bit more goopy like say fabric paint and going back to sort of the cake and uh, the cake analogy that i was saying about the pigment and the binder like sugars sugar and egg whites and butter and food coloring it's great but it's probably very gloppy and very thick that's when you add something like milk or water so that you can actually spread the icing over the cake or you can stuff the icing into a little frosting bag and make cute little swirls and stuff that's essentially the solvent, if you can understand that a little bit more than in regards to paint. So how does that help us understand paints? Going back to the significance of binder, so knowing that the solvent is something that helps you spread the paint onto a surface and then once the solvent has evaporated, it's just the binder and the pigment. For me, the biggest thing that I've always thought about in regards to what makes a good fabric paint is the durability of the paint once it's dried. So I feel like the binder in a fabric paint situation is something that is incredibly, incredibly important. And I'm going to show you now an experiment where I'm actually going to have these, I'm going to apply these three paints that I showed you and I'm going to show you the difference in consistencies when they're all dry to show you the importance of having a very good binder. So with this experiment, I'm going to apply three of these paints on just a normal plastic takeaway container so first thing is the craft paint and I I just painted it on like that so you can see that it's thin in some places and it's thick in some other places. So second one here we've got set a color opaque which is the fabric paint that I like to use. So I've got these three paints on this plastic takeaway container. And you can already see the difference between uh, consistency. I mean that also just has to do with obviously the formula that these paints were made from and the applications that they would be used for. But we're gonna let those dry and we're gonna come back to them and I'm going to show you the differences in regards to what they are when the solvent has evaporated. So while we're waiting for that to dry, you might be wondering, why did I just tell you all of that information? How is it gonna help you? You can actually start to use this knowledge to realize different problems that you might be having with your fabric paint. And therefore, when you know sort of what the problem is, you can sort of move forward from that in regards to trying to find a solution for your particular situation. For instance, if you're having problems with uh, the paint being the opacity of the paint or certain colors being very see-through. You know that this is a pigment issue and to move forward from that you can do things like uh, paint a white base and then add the color or you can add more layers of that color for it to become more vibrant. If you're having troubles such as the paint isn't actually staying on your fabric you will know that that is essentially a binder problem because we know that pigments and binders are essentially what dry paint is. The solvent isn't the issue. The issue is, is that by itself, the color could be great, the color could be poppin', but the binder is essentially what is gonna be the consistency of this paint. And if it's flaking off of your fabric paint, then you know that it's a binder issue and it's a formula issue. Or if you're using a paint and it's really thick and gluggy, or if, or if it's too thin, even just looking at the consistencies of the different paints that I've just used, you will know that it's a solvent issue. 
are you actually using the right paint for your application or if your paint is a little bit more dried out it obviously just means that the evaporation process may have already started especially if you've got uh, maybe a paint a paint pot that is sort of half full or almost empty and there's more air to sort of uh, dry out the paint and evaporate it if your paint is water-based you can add water to it to help it become more thin and just to help you be able to spread it over a certain area. So that's the point of all this information that I'm telling you. And I'm going to be showing you in the second part of this series on how we're actually going to go through actual uh, actual problems that an artist has been having and the conversation that we both had in regards to the just brainstorming ideas of, okay, what could we do to fix this problem? And it can sort of be like an exercise for you and it will just help you with the stuff that you might be dealing with. So this is taking a lot more longer to dry, so I'm going to be very annoying and say I'm going to reveal the results of this experiment in the beginning of the next video of this series, and you will see how different each of these paints turn out. And that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for watching today. I really hope that you learned a lot of things, and I hope that it is something that you will use and please stay tuned for the second part of this series if you are really interested in this type of information and knowledge and really want to sort of extend on that you can come along with me and i will show you this whole conversation i've had with this artist and all of the things that we troubleshooted to make sure that he found a solution to his problem thank you so much for watching please make sure to subscribe and to like if you want to see more content like this and to see the second part video and i will see you all in the future